Okay, cool. Let's look at some of these home rules. Homebrew rules then. Homebrew. 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 So we got. Uh, you want to share your screen? Um, I've got. Yeah, sure. Let's... Will that mess up the stream? I don't think it will. I've got it on the stream. It, it might helps. screw up the stream. Yeah. That sounds sketch. It might have layers upon layers. <laughs> oh, let's see what it's happens. Like an ogre. See what happens if I share my red girdles. Yeah, I think it'll. It kind of mushes us. Yeah, it does mess it up a little bit. Yeah. I'll just, bad. I'll just read it aloud. Let's see. And yeah, yeah. Follow the, follow the Twitch if you want to see exactly what we're looking at here. Look at them over, everybody. So let's see. Critical successes are max damage plus another damage roll. Um, critical failures result in consequences pulled from the Pathfinder Critical Fumble deck. Has anyone ever looked at that? I've I haven't looked, looked at, that. at it. The fumble. Deck. Let's pull it up. Yeah, let's, let's pull it up. Let's pull that up. Critical fumble. Didn't we have? And I don't remember who it was. But we were talking about it, I think, in chat about how like hmm. it wasn't. It was like the wild, the the wild magic table, and how somebody was really upset that we called it a critical fumble table. And he's like, "But wild magic's not supposed to be bad for you." I'm sure. like, "Yeah, but you still rolled a crit one, so something's going no. to happen." Uh uh, that was, that was Nefer. I think he was shocked that I ran. Critical fails on spells always have something bad I don't happen. I think that was Nefer. I think that was somebody that left the group. I think it was Nefer. Was it Nefer? Yeah. I don't remember. This was like his first session. I um, don't remember. I think. Most people are surprised by it, that I, that I run critical spell failures, um, so something cool or fantastic happens. Um. Like they lose all their hair? Yeah, like all their hair falls out. Something ridiculous. Just magic stuff happening, you know? But, uh... Yeah, then they were like, well, it's the same thing as Wild Magic. I was like, yeah, pretty much, kind of-ish. I don't know. It might be like double fail. <laughs> but I never quite put the two and two together. This is a Pathfinder roll table? Critical fumbles table? Is that what this is? I'm looking for D&D &D 5e critical hit tables and fumbles. Oh, it's Pathfinder fumbles. Yeah, they use Pathfinder really? fumble table. Yeah. Is that what that original thing said? Yeah. Pathfinder, Pathfinder. critical fumble deck. Oh... Um, I'll take a look at that. Pathfinder Critical Fumble deck. I'm having trouble finding something that's locked, not locked behind a paywall. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, we'll just, I, I think for the sake of time, we might as well just move on. Oh, it's a literal deck that you have to buy. Eh, yeah, move on. Yeah. Uh, you can crit on ability checks. Really? I mean... On ability checks? Yeah, that makes well, sense. Well, I mean, I... Why not? I mean, you don't... Critical success and critical failure across the board. Yeah. That's how I run it. That's how I run my games. I guess... Uh... I just think it adds... I. It doesn't... It, I, I just think it adds a certain amount of zaniness to yeah. an otherwise serious topic. Because you know me, I'm all about breaking the tension. Right. I think everyone crits... When you, when you roll a 20 on a, on a persuasion or anything ability check, I think everyone just automatically crits anyways, technically. Because everyone goes, oh, and it's like, oh, you killed it, you know? Now you're sleeping with the dragon. Like, I guess that's not really a home rule. That's kind of everyone's Well, reaction. I mean, that's the whole thing, right? A 20 will always be a success. Like, a natural yeah. 20 will always be a success. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because, like, you could have a plus 11 to an ability roll or a skill check or something. Roll a 19 and get a 30. Yeah. And the DC could be a 30. But well, you're never going to reach that 30 if your modifier is like a plus 8. So the only way to hit that mm -hmm. is to crit it. Because it's an automatic win. Yeah, or mm -hmm. if you have like Bless or, or sorry, Guidance or what other Bardic Inspiration. You can stack buffs. Bardic. Yeah, Guidance, Bless, Bardic Inspiration. Yeah, there's always all those things that I guess I never really take into account. Cause like you know, as a DM, it's like, well, I never, I never make a thirty dice check, you know, uh, because it's thirty. Your DCs are relatively low. They are, they are. I like people to succeed. Um, it's very, mm -hmm. it's very rare I ever give like a DC fifteen unless I just want it to be like, like, nah, this is tough. Like this is for sure tough. And then the you only time I did eighteens twice. I did an eighteen. What was that response to? It's so they were for relatively like difficult situation because i think one of them was for me um i think i was trying to do some sort of zany zany like yeah like i think i was trying to climb some rocks i can't remember i just did an 18 I don't remember recently. so it was just this past week wasn't it 
It was the genie one shot. The genie one shot? Yeah. And genie. I've missed a lot. Yeah, there was like a I made up two one shots this past week on the fly and they like they, they, they walked into a tavern in like the middle of nowhere in a desert. They're all dying of starvation at this point, and then like some arch demons puppet dude convinces them to enter a covenant with the genie and they have to go kill the genie. It got crazy. But like Yeah, it went it went a little nuts, I'll tell you what. The eighteen what was it for? I forget what the 18 was actually for. I can't remember. But yeah, I only do 18s if it's like a... I mean, I, I want you to fail, but I always give you that 2. That that 2, you can roll a 19 or a 20 to make it. But I mean, modifiers matter so much. I mean, when you have a plus 9, mm -hmm. I mean, 18 no longer looks that scary. You're still at 50% chance to succeed. Yeah. You could roll a 9 and still pass. Yeah. So... Um, and that's what's so funny, though, right? Because, like, in reality, on paper, that's a 50% chance to hit, right? That's pretty good. Yeah. And then you roll, and you roll a two. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. like, what yeah. the fuck? Mm-hmm. It happens all the time. That's why I like my magic dice. Um, I don't know where they're at right now. I've shown them to you guys before. My uh, my big old D&D &D box. Yeah, the really big ones. Yeah. Yeah, those things, they've never failed me. They've never failed me when I really needed them most. My pearl dice are righteous. Yeah, they like, always. That's when Mario hard. died. Like my my pearl dice were going hard on them, and I kind of feel bad because we were all just rolling dice in front of us this past Thursday, and I was like 17, 18, 16, 17, 18, 19. I was like, it's not stopping. <laughs> like I was like, I don't know what's happening, but I was like, oh, I'm serious. You're dead. You know. But um, yeah, I like this potion one. I'm looking at where did it go uh drinking a potion counts as a bonus action so combat plans aren't completely interrupted i half like that one because we just had a tavern talk ace i don't know if you missed it last sunday with the gut punch girls I did. the gut punch rp girls it. their dm she has drinking a potion as a bonus action unless you're in combat like you're in melee i mean uh mm -hmm. if you're in melee then it's like a full it's action. still a bonus action but you are left open to opportunity attack is that what it is? Yeah. So as you're drinking a potion, that gains opportunity attack to anybody in melee of you. Okay, so it's always a bonus, but if it's you're in melee, it's always a bonus action. They get an opportunity attack yeah. on you. I like that. Mm -hmm. uh, the way I run potion is, um, you can use it. You can drink it as a bonus action, but you have to roll it. But if you spend an action to do it, then you get the full heals. Hmm. That's interesting. That's not bad either. That's not bad either. But I, I, I think it's. Spending an action to drink a potion, in in the rules as written, is is it's too much. Yeah, a full action's too much. That, I think that's why thematically I'm in love with the uh, opportunity attack idea. If you're in melee and you can't like, you know, like hold Don't on, hit me. hold on, you yeah. know. So there's a chance he'll hit you, but there's because there's also like you're not just gonna sit there and take the hit, but he's also not gonna sit there and let you drink it. So I think an opportunity attack is like that nice sweet spot, mm. you know. I think thematically, that's I liked her ruling a lot. No, I think that made a lot of sense. Yeah, I so. might actually add that. Yeah, I thought it was perfect. I was like, man, I wonder where she. She got didn't that. do a ton of homebrew rules, at least you know no. outwardly. Uh, but apparently, there's like lots of give and take throughout their their role play and stuff. Yeah. Um, but she had some. I mean, she had some really good ones. Yeah, she had some great ones. Um, as <laughs> ten people in this person's group, um. As a result, we keep it two to each type of check. This keeps things moving. It's a really obvious thing that people would be checking individually. Oh, well. Yeah, as far oh, as... This is my biggest pet peeve. The stacking skill checks. My biggest pet peeve <laughs> is if my character is the one to ask for this check, why the hell are five other people also doing it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's... Why is it that I ask and I don't even get a chance to roll and everybody's like, well, let me do it, let me do it, let me do it. No. Yeah. A check should be left to one person that asked. And if the role play goes, well, I didn't find anything. Can anybody help me figure it out? Then somebody can come help. But I hate, I hate when somebody mentions an idea and then everybody else goes, oh, let me do it, let me do it, let me do it, let me do it. It's like, no, no. I want to read the help action to like try and like come to like a determination on this, you know, um... I think this is combat, though. What's it called out of combat, then? Like, I mean, it's still a help action either way. Yeah? So where's it at? Um, 
I just typed work. Is it yeah, we did something like that too, Claire. At least Dylan was trying it with his um, grim dark role play that he was doing on Saturdays. Was as they were traveling, he had a roll table, and he I would roll to table. see like if it was going to be a good encounter, a neutral encounter, a bad encounter. It was really interesting. That was one of the favorite my to this day like one of my favorite things. The traveling roll table I ever implemented. I think it was amazing. It was I got it from Professor Dungeon Master on YouTube. <laughs> And uh, he insisted, he's like, you got to have travel um, be interesting. So I downloaded, or I didn't download it, I just bookmarked this. 1,372 roadside encounter ideas. I got it on the screen now for you guys. <laughs> That's a lot of road encounter ideas. And what I do is I have my players roll a D100 or two D10s, whatever's easier for you. Um, and I'll look at the table. So like number, let's just pick one, 35. You're traveling on the road, and it says, The carriage is overturned and all passengers are dead, or are they undead? And then, like, I won't follow these to the letter. I'll make them up. So, on this leg of the journey, you encountered a carriage that was toppled over with a bunch of bodies on there, but they look like extra, you know, extra decrepit. They've been here a while, you know. Um, and then, yeah, you could have them undead. This one I can't get creative with. It's kind of like... Yeah, specific. are they dead or undead? But I had, like, a bee one. like. Oh, the bee one where they found the guy. They found the honeybees. Like, some guy had, like, the best honey in the land, and, like, literal killer bees came and, like, killed him when he opened a jar. Like, he was going to be fine, but he opened one of the jars, and killer bees came and got him and sucked out the honey. So there was one empty jar and three corpse jars. And I, I told the party that these jars are, like, the best honey ever, and it can actually benefit you, like, stats-wise if you drink it. You know, but if they opened it there on the road, just like the dead guy did, the killer bees would swarm, you know? <laughs> we all love killer bees. I thought that was a cool, like, pseudo trap. It's kind of like, it's not really a trap. It's just, uh... Don't open the honey. There's killer bees in the area. Don't open the honey, you know? What do you guys think of this, um, crit homebrew rule for hmm. attack rolls? If you crit, you roll a standard crit with, with the extra damage dice. But if they, um, if they roll max damage on one of their damage die, they get to roll an additional damage die and Exploding stack it. Dice. Exploding dice would be the term for that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's interesting. I think we've seen a lot of like crit attack roll homebrew kind yeah. of things like where it's I've automatic never seen anything like that. I think it's you cool. roll another dice or something like that. It's, it's not as consistent as the other ruling where it's just, you just have max dice and then just roll a second set. Um, that's very consistent. You're, you're, it's always going to have impact. Um, whereas the exploding dice, that the exploding dice rule works in other game systems because you're constantly rolling attacks, and every so often, the exploding stuff will happen where you can just do incredible things out of the fucking blue. But if like if you're waiting to finally roll a twenty, which takes a while, and then you try and get exploding dice, it, it'll almost never happen. You're like you're, the statistical chance of it of exploding is like so thin mm -hmm. that you'd never even notice it's there really like i think it's i like exploding dice but it just doesn't work with with a role that's as rare as a crit you yeah know? Mm -hmm. it, it needs to be a more consistent rolling well yeah. i yeah i agree uh jess from gut punch says the reason that she does max damage plus double dice is to keep the impact going. Like a crit's not just gonna do a little bit of extra damage, it's yeah. gonna hurt, but the enemy also gets the same thing if they crit. So when they hit you and they crit, it's disastrous and it hurts. Yeah. Like, it's very impactful. Mm -hmm. Well, like exploding dice could be fun if it happens. Mm -hmm. It just seems unlikely in d and 5e. Oh, I wanna add something to the roadside encounters. Um, with like my lovely little sheet full of things. <laughs> um, I also liked that when I was implementing the road encounters, and again, I got this from Professor Dungeon Master, I stopped describing travel in chronological time. I stopped describing it as it's gonna take you three or four days, so on and so forth. I just described it as, um, what's, what did he call it? He, he, he called it the bone road and however, many sections of the bone road you need to cross is how long it takes to get there. Each section is like an encounter. So you roll every time. So I'm going to be like, you have five encounters so you get to the next city. And they're like, oof, that's a long journey. Like that's, that's fraught with uh, danger because 
um, each encounter you're rolling something new, and there's totally banal, standard, even even nice encounters on this table. Some of them are bad, but yeah, like if it's five encounters, that's a long journey. If it's just two, that's kind of like you know, not the next town over, kind of. Yeah. You know, so I stopped describing it as days, so you don't have to keep track chronologically. It's just like you have five encounters on the way. It is tough keeping track of time. Period. As a DM. Yeah, so I feel like this took a little bit of the weight off my shoulders just by saying, you have five encounters. And it made it so much fun. Like, honestly, during my campaign, these encounters were almost more fun <laughs> than the campaign itself, to be, <laughs> to, to be honest. Like, they were just great. The road mm -hmm. is crossed by many animal tracks, as if a herd of beasts all crossed at the same time. That's so vague, you could do anything with it. And, like, the players could stop and do survival checks and go and hunt them down. And maybe you could make up an exotic animal out out to pasture with its herd. And maybe they want to try and tame it. And now we've got, like, survival and animal handling checks and stuff and make a whole thing of it. And it only takes, like, as long as the players are interested. Yeah. You know? And then they carry on to the next encounter, next encounter. Well, you know? I think that's the thing, right? Because travel in D&D &D can be three things it can be absolutely nothing you have five days to get there you have a carriage you get there in five days and it's like why did we even mention travel why didn't we say we just got to the new city yeah. or it can be just a ton of oh well campfire encounters and we're keeping guard nothing happens and it can be very benign or it can be exciting in a way that moves time enough that you're not spending hours on this travel but you're also getting something out of it like claire even says she gives players time to make stuff and find stuff and that's something again yeah. player prep kind of situation thoughts players need to know what they can find and what they need like that's tough it is tough uh, from a dm's perspective it is really tough because yeah. like if i'm scrolls potions a druid poisons, weapons <laughs> and i need to find items so I can create us more potions while we're on the road. I need to know what I need to look for to do that so I can ask the DM, hey, we're at a long rest right now. Can I take some of my time to try to go find these items and then craft these items? Yeah. So, I mean, that's a lot you can do, but travel can be so mundane sometimes and it feels like it means nothing a lot of the time. And I liked the, I liked the roll table a lot because it made travel mean something. You know what? Yeah. Like, I'm thinking about it as you're talking about it. Like, poisons. Poisons is the biggest thing. Like, when it comes to crafting items, it seems like everyone's on board with the poisons. You know? Everything else is kind of, like, hit or miss, whether they're interested. But, like, it seems like a lot of people are interested in the poisons and medicines and stuff. But, like, I'm trying to picture it, right? Like, from a DM perspective, I think what kind of sucks is that they're like, hey, can I make something? And all you can do as a DM is be like, well, I don't exactly have a list of ingredients... I don't have it uh, that, that, that you could put together to make a poison. And then on top of that, I don't know how many of those ingredients are native to this region. Like It's like expounding complications. So the best thing you can do to simplify it is to just be like, roll me a nature check. You rolled high enough? Sure. You found all the things you needed. Now you just need a full rest to make said poison. And then I just make up the poison. But I feel like the player has no control over any of it, aside from one roll, and now I have a poison. I would love for there to be a table where they can sort of concoct things, you know, like, okay, I you have- You could make one. Right, you could, you could make like wild wood and nightshade and this, that, and a third, and then you have like this plus that equals that poison and that poison. So there's like certain poisons they really want to make or like things they're looking for. So that way they're asking NPCs in shops or going to different forests and being like, oh, I love this. But um, I mean, making that table would probably take the better part of a day. Cause I mean, you're gonna want mm -hmm. something for every region, right? You're gonna want like something for dark and dank caves, something for volca volcanic areas, swamp areas, forest areas. <laughs> Claire says she might yeah. have something similar to that. One that I have that might have You'd have all. to make a table for each one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it definitely would be time, like take a lot of time to yeah. do so. So like, I guess what my question is having kind of verbally diarrhea of that everywhere. Um, <laughs> is kind of like, how could you do the same thing as just rolling a check and the DM makes it up, only more in the player's hands? Like, how, how could you work something out? Like, I want the player to describe the poison to me that they want to make, and <clears throat> then give it a name, and then I'll be like, you know, then do the roll, do stuff like that. I, I would like that to be in the player's hands, you know. You just have to make the tables. 
necessary. Yeah. That's so the that only way to do it. So they know what they need to find. Mm. Yeah. The way I'd probably handle it is I'd have a table for each, like, region that they're in. Like, a volcanic area table and a volcanic area... Um, not a volcanic a swamp area, forest area, table for each of those. Right. And I'd have them roll a survival check for gathering stuff. Um, and that survival check would determine then how many rolls they can make on that table to determine what they get. Yeah. Well, what, it, what about crafting items, like like weapons? So you know I them. would also call that a survival roll. Well, yeah, but like, do you as D, like, players don't ask. They hope to find magical weapons, not make magical weapons. But like, right. in the Proterran campaign, we got so many, like, we got blood opals, we got, you know, dragon scales, we got all Guardian sorts of tree stuff. Bark and stuff. And like, all those items I feel like could have been engraved into a weapon to make it a magical weapon. Well, that was your guys' fault. Because... Hey, I did really good with my guardian tree bark. You did. Thank you very much. You did good. Everyone else kind of missed the mark because I gave them all these like really cool materials and I described them as a master smith could take this and make whatever you want him to make out of it and I'll make a, a cool magical item. But when they got to the magical city, they didn't seek out the master smiths ever. They just had the stuff and they wanted to go take a bath and buy clothes and get drunk, get drunk at the tavern. They lit funny. literally, we did eight months of campaigning, and they never once went to the Dwarven District, which has all of the engineering and the blacksmiths and, like, everything. Mm -hmm. No one touched that quarter, not once. <laughs> like, <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> it, it was there. I, I gave it to them, but, like, no one capitalized on it well, except for Well, because I think players character. don't think about it. Yeah. They don't think they have the option. They just assume they're going to find things along the way, like, find already made weapons. But unless you are in a crypt, like somebody's long dead crypt where they buried him with his weapons. Well, that's that's when I came to the realization that because of what 5th edition has done to the game, people don't seek out magical items anymore. Yeah. They just seek out levels up. Like, <laughs> like no one cares about all the items anymore. There's a lot of like, it used to be back in the day, like if you got a plus one sword, everyone went bonkers. And now no one could could care less it seems yeah you know no one means no one means it negatively but i can definitely notice the lack of interest in magical items and weaponry yeah. you know until you just throw something in their face and i make up a really cool description like the blades of greed or the guardian cape and they're like ooh, ooh that actually sounds really cool that's a nice bit, bit of homebrew awesomeness you know but like other than that no one seeks it out have you had any players that like have asked for items or seen any of the like actively sought out magical equipment We're... I've only ever met one player that actively sought something out that was in my first ever game like period and we had a paladin that rolled with us for a while um and he really wanted dawnbreaker mm. he wanted like this long sword based on light or whatever he wanted and, to talk um, to your shit <laughs> yeah and he'd been asking for it since our starting level four. <laughs> um, and he was asking around, he said, I'm looking for Dawnbreaker. Have you seen this sword? <laughs> um, and eventually, we were around level 12 when the DM finally let him have it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and something like that, too. Like, say... Say the player knows of a magical item, whether just from player knowledge or backstory, right? They've heard of this magical item and they want to find it. Mm -hmm. Well, the job as the DM is to say, well, if you really want it, you have to go through these steps. You have to find these items. You have to do this and make it a journey to get there so that they earn it, not just receive it. Like, yeah. you don't want to just find it mm -hmm. in a crypt and be like, oh, I finally got my magical item that I've been waiting forever for. Like, you have to go out and seek it like it's its own quest, yeah. I think is a really important way to do it. Yeah, you know. And Tommy Fly, welcome. Um, he says it, it does feel like they make magic items so commonplace. Um, yeah, like, I don't know what it is. My... I still don't know if I'm wrong about it, but I just feel like the characters as written when you're making characters is that they're so strong that 
every class has spells. Every class can modify its racial attributes to put them wherever they want. Like, everything's just a big blob of whatever you want now. That there's no limitations. And without limitations, you have no desire to improve. You yeah. have no desire to seek out ways of making yourself better. That's why no one does buff classes or support classes anymore. That's why no one looks for magical items. Because, like, well, I already got it. Yeah. You know, why am I going to need a plus one anything? Because I'm too busy firing, you know... Eldritch Blast plus Hex plus this plus my Genasi extra plus two damage plus that you know like, yeah. Yeah. it's like why yeah. do I why do I need that sword now why do I need anything because I got it you know yeah that's that's where my mind's at is like characters are so strong now that like there's no desire or need to fill there's no need to fill so you don't seek it out that's that's why I think magical items have just like fallen off yeah to the wayside but we are like Dylan and I are the old people. Hey, Max. In D and D, we're the we're the old veteran people, right? Because yeah. like we started years ago. Sorry. I started playing three point five, like where it was a completely different world. Three point five was, you know, because I even feel like Beastmaster Rangers, their their beast really does nothing exciting anymore in five e. Where like I was a kitsune with a bear. And that bear was what did all the damage because I'm a little kitsune in the back that doesn't want to get hit or killed. Like, my beast was so important that to... I remember my yeah. DM to cripple me made us go through something where the bear didn't fit. So the bear couldn't come. And he's like, Oof. sorry, the bear can't fit in this hole. He's got to stay up there and wait for you. And we didn't have anything to polymorph the bear. So now it's just me and my little kitsune self yeah. in there terrified out of my life because my bear's gone. Like It used to be, yeah, you could, you could take out one player's thing and it'd be like their Achilles heel unless they had, like, cool backup shit. Yeah, or magical, magical items. items or something <laughs> like that to get them through it. It used to be so much more important and now it feels like the items which are my favorite part by the way of D D are cool magical yeah. items i start think... important in 5e i'm having a thought <laughs> so like maybe a way to break that expectation from a dm's perspective is <laughs> give your npcs insane magical items like like break the player's minds they're like what this NPC is clearly breaking the rules. You can't cast this many spells. You can't have that many fireballs. It's like, well, he has a wand of fireball. And like, oh, crap. Or he has this. He has that. Or like, what do you mean he has like 23 AC? It's like, well, he has a shield and that ring of protection and <laughs> this, that, and the third. But then like, are you going to make those items be able to be gained to the party once they kill that NPC? To pilfer the corpse? Yeah. Um, I, would, I would think so. If they can win the fight. I would think... That going up against people that are heavily laden with magical items and weapons and stuff um, should be a fight you're more than likely going to lose. But I think you should prep the players for it. You should be like, nah, this guy's got like a lot backing him up. He's got like a big ass company. He's he's armed to the teeth. He's got magical everything up the at the woo wah. So maybe this isn't a fight you want to pick unless you finally have that kind of power and that kind of players backing. don't care, man. They think they can beat God. <laughs> Right, and that's, I don't know, that's, you gotta take them down a peg sometimes? Not always. I mean, I think most players pick their battles, more or less. There's usually always that one player, though. <laughs> that one player is like, ah, fuck you, and, and does it anyway. Yeah, anyways, yep. <laughs> and then everyone, everyone dies. Ace, you missed it, by the way. Manda pulled, she pulled an ace on, uh, oh, yeah? on Thursday. I'm so proud. She, her character got, like, really emotional. Because like an, 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 an NPC that was important to her died, so she just charged in blindly in a rage, and yeah, like half the party died, and everyone else had to run. And <laughs> they set the enchanted forest on fire. Because they they initiated like the worst co like combat at the worst possible time. So that was funny. That was so funny. Yep, I think every player has to like for one reason or another. Yeah, I think. I don't know what's happening. Like, my computer's slowing down. Is yours? No. Yeah. I don't know. Mine's good. But. Um. Yeah. Kid, it's, kid, kid Tiz had to go to war to fight. War and fight their old paladin master to get a special sword. That Oof. Sounds, that sounds dope. Yeah, that sounds cool. You know. Me versus undead army. Heck yeah. Yep. Yep. 
That sounds awesome. I love this roll table so much. But, like, outside of combat, what are some homebrew rules that you guys like that aren't combat-based? Um, I personally don't like this, this rule, but a lot of my players do, including Claire. Uh, it's called the glancing blow. Mm. Um, and the way the glancing blow works is if you meet their AC, uh, instead of, you know, just hit, deal damage, it is, um, you hit, but you deal half damage. Okay. I, actually, I actually like the sound of that. Cause it like, but why don't you like it, Ace? I just don't like, I don't like nerfing my players like that. Especially if they go up against an enemy with a really high AC, like if I've got some big giant that they're fighting and he's got an 18 in AC. I know you said non-combat, but <laughs> I, yeah, I forgot just about said, Fuck that. Yeah, me, it's fine. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> well, the trick to get um, past armor classes is always spells anyways. Yeah, but, you know, you know, for your frontline fighter, if you have an AC like that, you know, they're not going to have any fun because they're never going to hit it. And then when they do hit it, it's when they meet the AC, and they're only dealing half damage at that point. That's why I don't like it personally. I guess, but, um... I guess it's the same... It, it, like, it does but... add a certain amount of, like, description. Mm -hmm. Like, meeting the AC is a glancing blow, where, like, your sword flies across their cheek or something. Uh, Tommy Fly says, would you willingly modify <laughs> the that glancing rule uh, to be one below <laughs> AC? <laughs> That is a, a, an idea I've never had. That could be interesting. So like, if you have 15, I, I 15 like instead of more. 16. That I kind of like that more. So if it's an 18 and you roll a 17, that's a glancing blow. Well, because it but makes an sense, right? Hit. Not every hit is going to be a direct hit. But in D&D, &D, you don't mm -hmm. really have that. It's either yeah, you, you hit him or you didn't. But especially in melee or, like, casting mm -hmm. a spell and you just happen to dodge, but you're singed on the shoulder, like... Yeah. Gives a more realistic feel, I guess. I like, I like what 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 Tommy Fly said because then it opens up a slightly because every one point on the D twenty is a five percent increase or decrease, so like that could be like a five percent increase to the amount of hits actually connecting throughout the game. So perhaps you're actually finding this minute way for people to hit targets more. There's le slightly less missing, even if that mm -hmm. one little hit is less damage. It's like you plus it does add some sort of like impact. To um, you know, rolling high but still missing. Yeah. 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 Welcome, Max. Good I mean, morning, my sleepy boy. Maximilian. <laughs> oh, dude. Uh, sorry about being late, guys. Uh, I was um out with some family friends that surprisingly came over. Oh, that's uh, awesome. And um, they were just like, oh, um, we're cool. Uh, we had plans, but uh, we can make room. Uh, <laughs> so, um. Yeah, we just came back from a walk. It was pissing down. Oh, goodness. Um, yeah. And I did not have a hoodie, which is fun. But uh, I was going to say, yeah, um, just giving the characters, uh, the, the players, more chance to do uh, damage and more chance to hit could uh, make it mm -hmm. to oh. some more interesting monsters, because there's definitely... Um, <laughs> the monsters get increasingly more interesting, and oh yeah, um, I love it when I have the higher the uh, the CR you go. Mm -hmm. I I you guys have seen my um homebrew creation rules. I guess we can that that would actually be a good like little segue into uh. Well, before we segue, would this rule also rules. apply to enemies hitting you? Because yeah, I'm of course, th I'm thinking that it could potentially backfire. Probably not enough to make it a big issue, but the thing is, as enemies get stronger in yeah. this 5th edition, they don't get, like, too much extra damage or too much extra to hit stuff. What they do get is multi-attacks up the butt. Like, they get, like, even the most basic creatures always attack twice, and then you get three, mm -hmm. four, five Oh, I know, attacks. it's ridiculous! The sheer number, the sheer fact that they can roll so many hits means, and since you've Marilyn. increased the range... The range like, half Especially against lower level, lower level monsters... Uh, that are potentially fighting PCs that can't even swing twice yet. See, that's the thing is most most 
PCs don't even get a secondary action until what, like level five, five level six, five, level six, seven. seven? Like that's I'm such never... a long time to be fighting monsters that are hitting you with two to three attacks per turn, and you can only do one one little swing of my sword, and that's all I can do, guys. Sorry, like. Yeah. I hate that. I I hate that second action takes so long to get to. And I wish there was a home for rule that gained second action outside of like yeah. light handed. Or just make the monsters more interesting for God's sakes, because they used to be really interesting. They had like mm -hmm. they took away so well, many immunities, so many resistances, and they just just pumped them full of multi attacks. And all the monsters feel really bland. Yeah. Well, also to be fair. Um... I think you guys are exaggerating the multi-hit just a little bit. The highest multi-attack on a low-level creature I've seen um, is, like, three attacks. I've never seen more than three attacks on any... Like, even dragons only get a three-attack yeah. multi-attack. Unless it's, like, legendary but actions. typically, before level five, any of those monsters at most will have two attacks on, in general, one. But two I'm attacks through the can still manual. be devastating to even a level yeah, 3, I'm level 40 party member. Mm -hmm. But those lower CR average, creatures will also like only deal about a D4 or a D6 of damage as well. With no modifier. Yeah. Because um, typically on multi-attacks uh, like that, they don't have modifier. And that's outlined in the creature table. Not table. Um, well, I guess the... Um... Card, the creature card. I guess we get onto the topic of combat value there, because if you're just throwing monsters at like a party because they're cool, then it's not going to be as fun as if you're throwing monsters at your party because it's you've already mentioned in the story or that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Combat's only as good as you make it, really. Mm -hmm. Which, Which is, is hard why because does anyone know home rule on dropping movement action to add in an early multi attack? An early multi attack. That's interesting. Ooh, what do you mean by early? So, allowing instead oh, of sorry. moving, as in early levels, gaining an extra multi attack. So you can choose to use your movement, or you can choose to turn that into an action. That's an interesting thought. I actually kind of like it, just because it, it, that's that's cool. It breaks away from the. I do uh, like that. I'm gonna write that down. It yeah, that's really from, interesting. Like, move, I like that idea. Attack, move, action, economy. It kind of breaks away from that, and just like you get into melee. And you finish I almost want to push for um, us to adopt that. Would that be strictly melee, though? Uh... Um, I would say... That's not really fair. I think it'd I have, so. We'd have to playtest it. Yeah. A lot of these, if we were to adopt any of them, we'd have to playtest them because for sure. Because saying only if you're in melee, Cause... you can choose... Because you can still only cast one spell at a time, even if you forfeit movement. Plus, how will that a affect spell a higher level play? How will that affect you at higher level play as well when you do have that extra attack? Yeah. Because thinking about it, fighters with action surge get an attack, extra attack, action surge action for another attack, then their extra attack, then their movement attack. Yeah, if they have that's two five weapons. attacks at level five. <laughs> if they have two weapons. Well, that's interesting. Just... And then that's a bonus action swing too. Yeah. So I think there used to be a homebrew combat rule set that had everything take up different amounts of time values and only using the time values to fill in turns instead of it just being move, action, minor action, bonus. I mean, that's how mm. Divinity was ruled, technically, was you had a certain number of action points and right. everything took a certain number of action points so you could delegate how many you wanted to use where instead of just only being able to, I can move, or I can attack, or I can do this. Well, the whole but at that point, we'd be changing it to a different game entirely. Yeah. It wouldn't be 5e anymore at that point. Yeah, the whole purpose of it being as painfully simplistic as it is is because, well, less is more. It always is. <laughs> like, less is always mm -hmm. more when it comes to these things, you know? Yeah. For, for running the game smoothly. You yeah. Know? But it is cool. I mean, it sounds cool. For sure, but there's really only so much you can do. Yeah, I think forfeiting the movement for an extra attack. Yeah, it sounds like there's a lot of potential problems, especially with rangers who already get like plus tens to hit constantly. And, like just, I mean, they're like they're, they're uh, that's shooting. That's dependent upon their stats. Rangers don't initially get any bonuses from features like that. I think does Hunter's Mark help them hit? 
Hunter's Mark just deals Hunter's like, damage. Hunter's Mark does extra damage. Yeah, which is already like hitting like a rocket because it's like a longbow D10 plus the extra D8 or something. Mm -hmm. like, D6. It's like... And you also, get, if you have X. You get fucking two of those. If you have X you do have Yeah, X. I don't think they get multi-attack until like level eight. Yeah. Maybe. Something like that. Maybe. Well, Rangers? Rangers? They get their extra attack at five. Yeah. I don't remember that. What if you all extra them? attacks are gained at five, except for College of Sword Bard, which gets it at six. Fighters do get I'm an monk. additional extra attack at level nine. I too had never got an extra attack. I know eleven. She got all the way to seven. Mm hmm There are some classes that also Wizard don't get gets an extra, extra attack. attack as a blade singer. Mm -hmm. At level six. Um, rogues. Rogues do not get extra attack. Of course they don't, because they have sneak attack, and that shit hurts like a brick. Yeah, yeah, Druids do not get extra attack because they can wild shape into things that get multi attack. Um, wizards don't get multi attack because fireball. <laughs> yeah. Um, all these things, if you don't have an extra attack, you have a compensation for it in some shape or manner. Yeah. So um, adding extra actions is very dangerous <laughs> for any reason. You know, that's why there is a haste spell, and there's a, pretty much haste spell, I think, is the only thing that usually gives you extra actions, unless someone's forfeiting their action to give you one, like, commanding stuff from, like, the fighter battle master, or, like, I think a few of the bards might actually be able to do it, like, were they, like... Nah, I don't think any bards can. I do know that, um, <clears throat> there's haste and action surge are the only two ways I know of to get proper action. Yeah, the, the battle master can use commanding something... So, in place of making an attack or spending an action, he can delegate another character in the party to do it instead on his turn. Oh. So that's like forfeiting your action to give it to another player. So, like, if your barbarian's crushing shit and they have, like, you know, you could be like, all right, you hit it, because I know I'm not going <laughs> to you know? So that's a yeah. cool... I like that one. Um, and there's, like, I'm sure there's more. I'm sure there's more ways to, like, fuddle with the action economy where you can give actions. There's usually a give and take, but yeah, as far as just forfeiting mm -hmm. movement for an extra action, that sounds like it could very easily break the game. <laughs> you know. Well, even the help action in combat, so we were talking about that earlier, like about the help action and what it can do. Um, on top of outside of combat, helping uh, somebody do a check or something gives that person advantage. Mm -hmm. um, but during combat, you can aid a friendly creature in attacking a creature within five feet of you, you faint, distract the target, or in some other way team up to make your allies attack more effective. If your ally attacks the target before your next turn, the first attack that is made will be with advantage. Okay. So using the help action in combat can give your ally advantage on their attack. I like the sound of that, unless, because in my mind, thematically, if it's two on two, I don't feel like you should be able to do that. I feel like if it's an even number of enemies and players, then you should. But if it's like two players on the same guy, then why not? Why not well, give I, advantage? Again, in a two on two scenario, you're also thinking about what you're giving up to give that person advantage. Right, you're no longer attacking yourself. You know, but it's just weird in my mind that like Plus you're for ignoring help action, you always have to explain how you're helping. <clears throat> Right. Because you may just not hit as hard. Yeah. Like, I think it's weird having to describe that you're going to ignore the opponent you're engaged with in order to confuse this opponent so that that guy can hit him better whilst you're already yeah. engaged with, with, a, with mm -hmm. an even, even number of opponents. So I feel like... So, I you might... could do it, but you're giving up a lot for it. <clears throat> Ugh, excuse you. But you're also gaining a lot, because advantage is really powerful. These aren't like plus twos like they were back in the day. Plus two, plus ones... Advantage is very powerful. There's no two ways about it. Every time we've had advantage, it's been like an obscene difference in the die roll. Yeah. It's very rare you get like a double fail. <laughs> Unless you're Vari. It's almost a guaranteed um, hit. Um, with, um, with multi-attacks, if you think about flanking, um, how much of flanking are you actually going to give? Because if a round is six seconds, then that's definitely enough time for the creature to, after the first attack, turn around and then break the flank. If things are meant to be happening simultaneously instead of an RG, uh, RPG game, then um, shouldn't the first attack only be a flank? Hard to say. I mean, because 
the whole point is you're being attacked from both sides, and that doesn't stop happening whether you're aware of it. Because it's not a sneak attack. It's not an ambush. It's active combat where you have more than one opponent. One's in your blind spot and one's not. You're going to have to deal with that. So I think that's why it's all advantage until you can get some help to get out of that sticky situation. Because it's not the ideal place to be in melee. If you've got multiple dudes on you, good luck, you know. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think even the best MMA fighter, if he's got two, three dudes on him... You know, uh, that's a tough, that's a tough fight. No one's going to stand back and um, just watch like the Hollywood movies. <laughs> I mean, Alex, Alex said, said what if flanking what? was an flanking advantage wasn't... but a minus to the flanked creature's AC? At the end of the day, advantage and lowering or buffing AC or your to hit is all kind of the same thing, kind of. to be fair. Because if you lower it, it just means your, your one roll has to be lower or if you keep it the same, you have two rolls to get over that AC limit. It's all kind of the same thing. Um, yeah. I've always I've always seen it as more of making it so you have an easier chance to hit, and having advantage on the hit or upping your chance to hit by a modifier. All it's kind of the same kind thing. Kind of the same thing. Yeah. I don't know why. I've just always loved. But players don't take advantage of flanking. Uh, Not until you do it to them. (laughs) Then they're like, oh shit, we need to start flanking. Uh, I I don't know why. I just, something about it. I know advantage (laughs) and flat modifiers are kind of the same thing, but I just, for some reason, feel better about running a game where you get plus twos or plus fours as opposed to just advantage, disadvantage. I don't know why. I just like that system better and I can't describe it. (laughs) Well... (laughs) I guess uh, concrete numbers like pluses are a lot more reliable because the amount of times that dices have fucked you up and fucked up characters and yeah. <laughs> yeah. Inspiration? Uh, I believe, I think, I think inspiration, inspiration is raw. Uh, but the way people use inspiration is wildly different. Wildly, yeah. Mm-hmm. Everyone does their own inspiration. But I've, I've actually, I've never, um, except from Bardic Inspiration, actually seen or used Inspiration in-game. I feel like a lot of play, uh, DMs never seen... don't give out Inspiration tokens. Anymore. I think it's just forgotten about. Yeah. What's... I think it's very much forgotten about. I think players will want to stack what it. What does it even do? It gives you advantage on any yeah. dice roll, period. Yeah, it lets you re-roll a chosen dice roll. So it could be... It could be anything. In combat, it could be you <clears throat> failed your deception check and you want to roll it again at a very opportune moment. It, it could be a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's usually what inspiration does. Okay. Now, my, the most interesting homebrew rules have always been character creation. Because every DM does it different. Yeah. Every single one does it at least a little bit differently. Um... So, like, for me personally, um, I like having buff up the... I've already got... That's why I got excited when I heard we were talking about um, homebrew rules, because I've always wanted to talk character creation with other DMs. <laughs> hmm Um... I like, like, uh, I... What do you guys think of Devil's Dice? I forget what that even means. I know Where it's your thing. You, know, you guys might have done it once with me. Um, yeah. Devil's Dice is a homebrew character creation rule mm-hmm. where you would roll your stats against the DM's roll. Mm-hmm. And the DM can tell you two things about it, and then you decide if you want your rolls or theirs. Oh, you make it into a game? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Basically. Uh... Like a little a little discussion game. It's like my role. It's, it's like playing bullshit. Is basically what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Um, whether you got the better role or not. Um, mm-hmm. The DM can see your role, but uh, you cannot see theirs. I don't know. Do you have thoughts? I don't know. For me, in terms of like homebrew, when it term in terms of character creation, my roles in the end to me as a player don't really matter that much. I don't really care if I get a lower or higher number because I focus more on the role play 
backstory, personality, concept, anyway. That's just me as a player, though. I'm not a min-maxer. I'm shit at combat, no matter how hard I try. I'm just shit. I'm really <laughs> bad. I don't know how to fight, even when my character knows how to fight. Um, but you put me in any roleplay situation, and I will do fabulously, and my role may or may not affect it, you know? So, for me... The dice rolls aren't a big deal, but in terms of with I Afton, forgot my audience. right? So Afton <laughs> is uh, a summer Aladrin. She is a barbarian, and she's got like divine rage or divine something, right? And a lot of homebrew that came into that was it's not necro necrotic damage or radiant damage. She's reflavored to fire damage. A lot of her things are reflavored to fit her backstory and her character. I like reflavoring more than I like, you know, worrying about dice rolls. However, I know a lot of your players love the devil's dice uh, and they get a ton of fun out of it. So for... it's always fun. Cause I always yeah. roll better than them and they always <laughs> never trust me. Yeah. I think, uh, I don't know. I guess like I'm not against it or for it. It's really just, if you as a DM think it would be fun, yeah, run it. I think that's really... Why not? Uh, give like, yeah, give just, the players a chance to do something different. Just playing a game with your players before you actually play the game. <laughs> it's just like... So, yeah. For me, uh, I don't think it's good or bad. I think it's preference. It's just yeah. like, if you think that would be fun for you, go for it. I think it's a great idea. You know, for me, I probably wouldn't. You know? I just let them... Just let them do the two rolls, pick them, and move on. Yeah, because too many choices gives me anxiety. Anxiety? <laughs> That's that's for the edition of like, shell is too ah! many choices, you know. Uh, Coming from a three point five player, where there were even more choices. I don't remember well enough. If I feel like back in the day there wasn't that many choices. I three know, point. I don't know what it evolved point, to over time, but. Um, I haven't played three point five, but everyone I've talked to that has played three point five has said five E is a dumbed down version of it. I it's a dumbed it down version of it with way too many options because with 3.5 you had to take into account of everything it's not in terms of character creation or anything like that but you had to knock your own arrow in your action you could just not shoot you literally had to be like i have to notch my arrow first and then i have to shoot like there were a lot more moving parts that made it really hard to be overpowered until you reached those higher and higher and higher levels. Like, you needed plus one magical armor. You needed plus one sh swords and shields. Otherwise, you were going to get wrecked every single time. Characters yeah, you had to say draw sword. Ooh, like, you draw. had to say, I'm drawing my sword. Otherwise, you didn't draw your sword. Yeah. And now you're trying to attack with the wind. Like, it was a much different... It was brutal. It was brutal back then. It, it was incumbent upon players to... It, it, it would, the, the way the system was built was kind of like forcing people to think on think in character and constantly. Like, you know, like you would... If you left your sword in the other room, like, it would be gone if you forgot it. Most things you forgot, you didn't get to do. And, like, most actions you didn't take or didn't speak up on got left in the, to the wayside. Which everyone's has a super polarized opinion about. They all want it done for them. Other people are like, no, you shouldn't have anything done for you. And it's like, eh, I don't know. There's no right answer, I guess, yeah. on that, you yeah. know. But, yeah, I don't remember it being too many options. Not so much options in terms of, like, character creation, but you had to be very coherent about what you were doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Because what are, what are if you didn't thoughts, say Max? you were doing something, you didn't do it. Like... Mm -hmm. But again, that's just a way they like, that's just a play style almost. And that's how the rules back then were written. 5e mm -hmm. in and of itself allows for so much creativity. I think it just tries to turn players into like gods that can never die. And that's also boring to me. You know, like, I don't, I don't want to be, like, so overpowered that I'm taking out, you know, a beholder in three hits. And then I'm just like, that's cool, let's keep going, and let's fight ancient dragons. Like, I don't like to be godlike. But, again, personal preference. Hmm. 
I've never really liked playing higher levels. And it's exactly for that reason. Like, um, 8. 8 was pretty much the, the, the peak of what I was comfortable with. <laughs> yeah. Very different opinion. Yeah. <laughs> huh. Well, that's the I thing, though. The just, higher level get, you get, mm -hmm. the more the DM has to throw at you. And the higher level a player gets, I mean, Jesus, it's almost like you have to force kill them if you want them to hurt. Like, even fighting off against a dragon, level 14, 15, 16, that dragon means next to nothing with a party of four. Hmm. That's true. Also, it, it, However, takes, it takes the value out of um, emotional scenes and stuff. So when when someone's so overpowered they feel nothing because they feel like the world can't touch them so things don't have weight unless you're literally throwing eight black dragons at them and just <sighs> that's it true. gets borderline comical at that point yeah. however um this hasn't really been established a whole however higher level play on G in 5e is to properly run it, um, the DM needs to understand how to. And 5e is very much built around resources. Um, it's not meant to be like uh, a couple encounters and you're actually at risk at that. Um, like, for example, let's say you're level 20 and you're raiding Tiamat's home, right? Well, that's not just going to be a straight battle with Tiamat because you could smack Tiamat at level 20. That's great. However, that's not the case. If you're raiding the lair of Tiamat, you first got to get through um, several dragons. You have to waste resources. You have to use spell slots. You have to use your action surges. You actually have to put resources into these fights. Um, and by the time you actually get to the dragon god, goddess, um... It's actually more of a challenge now because you have less spell slots, you've used your potions, um, you've burnt through equipment, you've burnt through ammunition. You're very right. You are absolutely mm -hmm. right on that. And that's why and that's I hate higher level play because I'm not a combat player. Mm -hmm. I would get so bored, I would zone out and I would turn on another game <laughs> on my computer. Do combat, and I combat, wouldn't combat, be combat, present. Combat, combat. I hate it. I don't care. That's, that's, I think for me as a player, my level doesn't matter because I can play in the world all through roleplay and I'm not even going to hardly use a charm person spell because I'm going to try with my own words and my own actions and my own personality to charm them over forcing them into it. For me as a player, I have no desire for it. Where on the totally other flip side of the coin, players, there are players that love that, that eat it up that thrive on it, that sit there and count how many arrows they have and mm -hmm. think so far into it and play it more of a tactics game than a role-playing game. And again, that's the, joy, that's the joy of D&D is that you can play it however you want to play it. Mm -hmm. and, and it's available for everybody. But for me, I would let you fight those dragons all day long and I'm going to go find a tavern to sit at and talk to the bartender. <laughs> They're both good, you know. But yeah, I don't know. I think the hardest part is trying to find a middle ground because the way 5th edition is, because yeah, me, me and Ace both know that it's like, if you really want players to have combat difficulty, there needs to be multiple encounters, and those could yeah. easily take up whole sessions, Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. with very little role play. And if you try and do a nice blend, which always sounds nice, right? That's what everyone wants. Like, you ask them, do you prefer combat or do you prefer role play? Everyone wants a blend, right? But like, given the rules, it's like, well, I'm going to have to run you through a lot of combats in this dungeon. There's not a whole lot of room for role-playing unless we're doing a campaign, in which case this dungeon might take you two or three sessions. Yeah, one <laughs> are hard. I mean, the best... the My favorite combat ever with you was the Earth Spirit Temple. Yeah, the the demon of greed the demon of the... greed but it wasn't just the demon of greed <coughs> we had to get through this temple there were multiple fights we had no time to rest no resources and then the next session a full four hour session was spent on a boss fight yeah 
And it wasn't just fighting the boss. We had to use the terrain. We had to hide because he was doing massive explosions that could, like, hit you no matter where you were and all sorts of stuff. That was the best combat ever, but there was roleplay also in that combat. Yeah, there was. Mm -hmm. But if I had to do that every single session, it would lose impact for me. For me, combat has to have some sort of impact and make sense to the story. Otherwise, it's just like, well, that's another band of goblins. Yeah. Yeah. But again, I'm a very specific player. So <laughs> I realize that I'm a little role play princess over here, and that's all I want to do. Uh, <laughs> so let's let's find another homebrew rule. I'm just gonna read one off, I guess. Mine is a very complex system of determining the rarity and power of magic items. Uh, this person says, no longer do you get adamantine armor, you get Merrick's plate, which is a plus one adamantine full plate with protection and evil and holiness. Uh, this works superbly. It also works well with the immersion. I mean, it's much more story-like to have the one ring <laughs> rather than the simple ring of invisibility or Gandalf's staff rather than the staff of the Arch Magi. Okay, so I'm not sure if that's really a homebrew rule, but he's saying just the flavor of his magical items yeah. rather than just pick from a list where instead of just a ring of protection, you give it a name, give it a history, stuff like that. Claire uh, says you're going to force me to do more RP stuff, and I love that. I was like, be ready, Claire, because if you give, give me too many combats, I'm going to be really bored, and I'm going to hate that I'm bored. <laughs> um, requiring players to do a long rest in order to level up. That happens in a lot of D&D &D 5e games. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I've ever come across someone that requires that. Yeah, I've never been in a but... campaign where they've required it. That's typically when it happens anyways, though. Yeah, because you finish right. off a big combat. Which probably ends your session, and then you hit a milestone, the session's over, you win, you can... Claire says that's rules as written. Huh. Flavoring magic items into heirlooms instead of just magic items. No, the, the long rest. The rest. Oh, the long rest thing? Yeah, that's... Is that rules as written? I'm pretty sure that's a thing. Really? I don't know. Yeah, but I mean... Even Learning about normal rules. Rules as written are usually using XP instead of milestones. But True, that's, that's a good point. And like the the long rest thing again, that's an option, you know. Um, mm -hmm. As a more combat heavy player, do you prefer XP or milestone leveling, Ace? Milestone. Yeah. I don't want to fuck that at all. No fuck one. that. I've never <laughs> met anybody that likes XP level ups. Yeah, I don't. No think, one does. I don't think any human being on this planet cares about it unless it's the system that automates it for you like um yeah. i did play with a dm that did um xp once but they did it their own way and it was party based mm -hmm. um so they quadrupled or they multiplied however much you needed to level up by the number of people in the party but they also multiplied the xp gained by the number of people in the party and they kept track of it yeah and when you hit this point you leveled up. I, I don't understand XP. Tracking XP is like tracking arrows or tracking rations, and it's just like, eh. eh. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know? <laughs> it's just me. Tommy says, I've I always mean, wanted to be involved in a game that had level ups require going to a trainer circa EverQuest. That's kind of what you did I, in your grim dark roleplay. What I did. In a way. What I did in my grim dark campaign was. Um, there was an opportunity to power level your characters by sort of taking them out of the action and doing a time skip where they're just in town training or they're just doing a massive training 80s montage um, in order to sort of power level themselves. That that I had implemented because we needed to get to the end of that campaign as quickly as possible because yeah. a lot of real life stuff was happening. I would say if you wanted to have trainers power level um i would probably implement a secondary system where the world is evolving whilst they're doing that so if they actively choose to take themselves out of the game to go train and we time skip and they got levels the the big bad or the evil force is winning easily with spades stuff is going down outside in the world i think that would be kind of cool that is something that i feel like isn't always taken into account Unless other people have had different experiences, but like time in terms of the world and the acceleration of a big bad's big badness, 
Like you could go spend four sessions in town, five, six days doing shit all. The big bad's still doing stuff. And I feel like that's not always taken into account in a campaign. It's like, oh, well, he's still where he is now, so you can still go to him. And it's like, yeah. It's been like five days. It's hard. It, it's, it's, it's hard. I had a friend who, uh, who uh, ran Curse of Strahd, and when the players first encountered Strahd, decided, okay, now Strahd's gonna prepare, because he, he knows the players are coming for him, so why not, uh, you know, beef himself out and, and get ready for the players? And that's exactly what he did. The players got wiped. <laughs> yeah, because the whole Curse of Strahd yeah. thing is supposed to be like, they have to go find certain magical items to even really finish him off or contend with him that are specific to the story. So yeah, why wouldn't Strahd? I've heard so many crazy things with Cursor Strahd, though. They become his minions. Somebody ends up marrying him. Like, uh, so many things have happened in the Cursor <laughs> Strahd campaigns that make no sense to me because I've never been in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know about this luck mechanic after like reading about it. Mercer's Resurrection. That level up hit die rule through every kind. What's Mercer's Resurrection? You, I don't get, know. you get weaker and dumber or something every time you have to get resurrected. But Resurrection is like there. Until your character is useless and has to retire or something. Wasn't that. I, I think that's. I don't how know they anything about, about Matt Mercer in Critical Role, honestly. Which is an old school thing. That was an old school thing. When you tried to resurrect party members, they usually came back with extra flaws, they didn't come back whole. So I think Mercer's ruling is actually then a ruling that was already in place. Um, below Perhaps average. in a previous edition. Yeah, mm -hmm. some, some really old edition. Well, I mean, everything's been done, period, so no one has true originality in anything. But, yeah, that was a thing. I kind of like running no resurrection sometimes. I like taking that out of the equation. I think it makes it so interesting. Well, of course you do, Dylan, because <laughs> you love torturing your players. Yeah. Well, I liked it in my my Heroes of Proterra campaign where true resurrection was gone and necromancy wasn't the same thing, you know. Like, necromancy was the only thing you could do. It's the closest you could get to bringing someone back to life, and of course that's vastly different. Turning someone into a zombie is not the same as bringing them back to life, you know. And doing with resurrection created a lot of these awesome story arcs where people have a really freaking hard time dealing with death. <laughs> even though they have all this magic at their disposal and they know the gods exist and they d they divine and do all these things, the one thing that cannot be touched is the souls of the people from beyond. You know, you might be able to commune with them, but, like, you can never bring them back. And it's a hard thing to deal with with all this magic and everything about, you know. So, I don't know. I felt like it made things more interesting story-wise to not have Resurrection be around. I've never actually had to use Resurrection anyways. Has anyone here? <laughs> like... Someone's died officially, and then the party goes on a quest to resurrect them. I've actually never experienced that as a player or as a DM. To be honest. So, um, Honestly, I'm scared to. <laughs> I, in like one campaign, so much one? in my very first campaign, my very first character uh, sat in a chair that he wasn't supposed to for some ritual, and he ended up dying. Um, and the body was taken over by some demonic thing that we never found out what it was because the campaign kind of disappeared. Mm -hmm. Um, but we, the entire thing was basically just a build up to fight this guy and get our friend back. So that's how you, you basically brought him back, was to, yeah, mm -hmm. kind of like the venture well, to the hells. Kind of. We never did get to, but I I'm, I don't know what would have happened, but that was kind of what we were shooting for, or hoping anyways. But that wasn't like going out of our way to do it, that was more just playing the campaign, and eventually we'd see him again. Mm. <sighs> yeah. I mean, that's the thing, right? For me, as a player, I find it a lot more interesting if you're wanting to truly resurrect somebody, you need to find a way, essentially, to go to hell and pull them back instead of just, oh, let's go spend a couple hundred gold, buy a diamond, and use a revivify scroll. You know? Like, that's so much more interesting to me. 
Well, Revivify does require you to have the diamond on hand, as you cannot revivify, revivify someone that's been dead for more than 60 seconds. Yeah. So, yeah, like... It's... I thought it was 10 minutes. I'm pretty sure it's one minute. It should be 10 minutes. Google. Yeah, Revivify Doing it. is supposed to be dead for 10 minutes. Anything beyond that, they're gone, I believe. Mm. Even then, 10 minutes. 10 minutes is, yeah, that. not a lot of time, roleplay-wise. It's a lot in combat, but... Yeah, last minute, so 60 seconds. Really? You touch a creature that has died within the last minute. Which one's the 10 minutes, then? Or maybe... I'm, I don't know. Weird. I don't think there is a 10 minute one. So Revivify is one minute. Let me check, like, ninth level spells. I think you're spells. thinking, like, 10 rounds. Ten rounds is one minute. Resurrection yeah. is ten days. True resurrection is a hundred years. And then revivify is one minute. Has it always been one minute? I think you're thinking ten rounds. Huh. So sixty seconds. Huh. Weird. Okay then. But how about this one? Hidden death saving throws. Well, we already know about that one. Yeah. But what about? Using consumables, bonus action went over it. HP gain when leveling, I've already seen that one. Rolling abilities in order? Oh. Nah, I'd never do that. <laughs> what? Players roll six ability scores when they first create characters, then choose... Oh, this is the, this yeah, is the Grimdark thing yeah, I did. Yeah, that's Grimdark. Where you are rolling your 46 drop the lowest in order, so you don't actually get... Yeah, to you don't get to pool. pick it. It's the difference between having mm -hmm. a pool that you can plug, plug and play, or just running through it. I hate that, but I never want to do that. Um, nope. I think, what was the difference? This one kind of like... I'd finished. never make players do it. They choose which scores, so blah, blah, blah. For example, a player that wants to play a fighter can put their highest role into strength, blah, blah, blah. The idea behind this rule is allow players to play whatever type of character they want. Wait, I'm, I'm confused. Did I read this right? They then choose which... So this is a pool. So where does the in order come in? I feel like this was mislabeled. Uh, no, this is establishing how it was done, how it's done, and then it's saying... Then uh, it will go on to explain the way that this rule works. Right. So it's saying the way we do it is we roll our stats and then we can allocate them as we want. But the rule itself is that um, yeah. you'd roll your d20, you get a 16, now you have a 16 string. Roll your d20, you get a 14, you have a 14 in deck. So here's something I'll bring up regarding the ability scores. Uh, let me know how you guys feel, because I experimented on my Grimdark campaign. Where every time, where all of the new characters actually started at level 0, and they didn't have a class. Um, they also rolled all of their modifiers in order. So yeah, your first roll was strength and so on, and it just forcibly plugged into those things. Um, whenever they milestoned to level one, which usually takes one session, unless some extenuating circumstance made it take a session and a half or two. But what I did was I had them all be level zero with no class until they got to level one, and then they got to pick their class, depending on how they role played, whatever seemed cool, like, the character I made feels like he'd be a fighter, or like maybe yeah, your stats would determine it. What do you guys think about that? I like doing level zero and like adding some restrictions in there and making people think, you know. In terms of the zeroth class thing, uh, I really like, um, <laughs> I really like that because uh, for, um, for the modern campaign that I was doing, that I was planning basically, um, I did entire one shots fleshing out uh, characters, backstories, and stuff. And in that one shot is where they got their powers and stuff. And each individual, uh, each individual person had their own story that ended up giving them their powers. And yeah, yeah, I liked it. You know, I might even I'm already thinking of what if I changed it to like they all start at level zero. All of their stats are ten across the board and then when they go to pick when they go to level up to one they roll 1d6 and add that to each of those tens so you could have like an 11 a 12 13 14 15 16 16 would be the max because some games do that where 16 is kind of your max starting off anyways um excluding you know 
racial modifiers and level ups, ability score increases. Um, I feel like that would be kind of cool too. So that way, like you start off with such a blank slate, and then um, yeah, you just kind of get buffed up right there when you become like a full fledged adventurer, and then pick your class according to how you roleplayed up to that point. That might be interesting. Max mm. disappeared. Max disappeared. <laughs> no. Maximilian, come back. But um, are we doing this to an hour and a half now, or just an hour still? No, we just been talking. Yeah, we just said we're just gonna do it. Okay. Yeah. Me and Steph will just hang out, and yeah, I guess whatever's going on with you and Max, just pip, pip on, pip off, whatever you want to do. Mm. But I, I, I would, I liked doing. Um, I was talking to them about how, like, in my campaign, everyone started off at level zero and didn't have a class mm -hmm. to begin with. And then they got to kind of pick their class once they finally got to level one. I thought that was cool. What do you think? I mean, I liked it. I thought it was interesting. Yeah. Um, a lot of people wouldn't like it. A lot of people don't like being not level three. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, um... It is what it is, right? It's like, I don't have my subclasses and spells and abilities and this, that, and the third. It's like, it doesn't feel like, I guess to me, a legitimate complaint. I feel like it's more like you're just focusing on the bad rather than the potential good of actually, you know, role-playing rather than... It's because player the, the character sheet and leveling, I would continue to say, is only about combat. Yeah, If is. you are so convinced that you need to be level three, it's because you're worried about combat. But our best run shots, our best role play moments, our best time had no combat. Yeah, the, the no combat ones can be really great. Resurrection was cast if any. Did form. I miss the mystery one shot, by the way? The new one? Uh, I had two mystery one shots last week. They yeah. weren't murder mystery one shots, they were just random. Yeah, they were just like, mm -hmm. I didn't like give them a title or a description. But what was Tommy Fly saying? Um, I had someone home rule that if resurrection was cast of any form, they created a scene from the perspective of the spirit deciding whether or not to come back to the world of living. That's interesting. They can say no. Um, yeah. I like that. That sounds cool. If the role play feels like it would warrant it, if you already knew that that character kind of didn't want to come back, then I'd give them the opportunity. I don't know if I would do it every single time, but I would well, always give the players- Well, how often are you do resurrection? Yeah. I would always give players the option. Is probably how I would run it. You know? That's really cool. Yeah. Um, they have to be willing and raw. Uh, yeah, I was thinking that in the back of my head, too. <laughs> it's like the, the character has to be willing to come back, too. I think that was always a thing. I just wasn't sure. But, yeah, Claire kind of clarified that for me. Yeah. <laughs> she clarified it. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Um... If the creature's soul is free and willing, yeah. If they're willing to come back, which would be such a dick move, because resurrection is so expensive and so difficult to even yeah. get to, and they're like, he didn't come back, and the priest that you finally hired to do it is like, yeah, that's actually because you didn't want to, and they're just like, what? <laughs> I don't even know when that opportunity would would arise, because all the players are around the table, and. You know, like, you're vaguely aware of metagame what everyone's doing. So it's like, if, I feel like everyone would already know if he's going to say no or not, you know? Again, I don't see when the opportunity would arise. I don't know. But to sort of piggyback off of that rule, um, I definitely love giving players last words when they die. No matter what. Like, I find a way. Like, even if they were, like, obliterated by, like, a orb of destruction or whatever it's called orb of annihilation like i find a way to like have enough of them left over to where they always get last words when they die and uh that's been a tried and true thing i think that's worked out really last well. words yeah last words are totally worth it you know a send off for the character yeah absolutely totally worth it you know and then we're just on the role play side of things i think it's really interesting to hear from people that play D&D in just a different way because yeah. so many of these things don't matter to them you know defense rolls 
Mm. Rolls 1d20, and adds their AC to it. The AC to exceed is 20 plus the enemy's attack bonus. I think if I was doing that, I'd make I'd have their AC establish a modifier. What's the point of having AC if you're going to do defense rolls? Yeah, I don't know. Um, maybe, like, if you have an 18, that's a, typically a plus 4. So I would roll, I would rule it like if you have an 18 AT, you got a plus 4 to your defense roll. Huh. That could be fun. I'd want to play test it, though. If the enemy attacks, it automatically hits unless they successfully defend. They roll a 1d20 and add their AC to it. The DC to succeed is 20 plus the enemy's attack bonus. Huh. Yeah. So you're no longer doing attack rolls anymore. You're just declaring an attack and the player does a defense roll instead. More rolls to the players, essentially. I guess it's not a terrible idea. It's always nice to put more power to the players in a, in a non-game-breaking way. Yeah. You know? So it'd be like, if a monster had a plus six, you'd have to get a 26. If you happen to have 18 armor class, you'd need to get a 26. So you have to roll like an eight or better. So I guess it's the same thing in yeah. a way. It's just a roll for the players. Yeah. Hmm. Sounds like a lot of math, though. It sounds like a lot of math. A lot of extra steps having to, like, yeah, take the yeah, 20, Yeah, Tommy Fly says this. my biggest problem with defense rolling is that it adds so much more time. Yeah. It's too much math. Too, too many math. steps. Yeah. Every time you add another step to the equation, you're also doing that step for four or five players worth of people, and you're, quite, you're exponentially increasing the amount of actions need to be taken mentally and physically, and it's just like, pfft, bogs down the game. That's why less is always more. You know... Plus, also, in turn, you're having, when they're declaring atta an attack, they're no longer rolling. Flanking bonus instead of advantage? Mechanically and thematically, it makes sense to have a bonus against an enemy who is flanked by your allies, but most players, and especially DMs, find the default bonus of having advantage on attack rolls a bit overpowered. The alternative is to give a flat plus one or two bonus added to the attack roll instead of advantage. Hmm preference i guess yeah yeah i mean yeah it's it's not as strong as having advantage um i don't know i feel like making melee combat as deadly as possible makes for more interesting games yeah you know my simultaneous attacks the flanking this that and a third we've play tested it for enough months for me to feel like it's actually not overpowered it's right on the money no you know I'm just saying from experience, not opinion at that point. Um, yeah. Mind you, our combats, because we don't do initiative, which is our biggest homebrew rule. The no initiative combat. Go by so fast. Yeah, they do. And my only, my thoughts with the no initiative combat is I think the reason it's so much more engaging is just because you immediately go to all the player turns right off the bat. Yeah. It does have a lot of complications. You do constantly have to like re-explain that things are happening simultaneously, so on and so forth. It's hard to get everyone on the same page consistently with the no initiative combat. You know, I think that's the only true flaw in no initiative is that it's hard to get everyone to stay on the same page about it. Yeah, they're always surprised every time whenever they're running to take cover, or they're doing a shot and trying to move somewhere safe that they get shot anyways, you know? Right. Because on that turn, whilst you were moving simultaneously, you were being shot at. And no, it won't affect their role at all. It's the same thing, your armor class is there, and so on and so forth. If you're already behind cover, when they deign to shoot you during that round, that's different, you know? Yeah, it's a weird one. I still like the no initiative combat. I think players just have to be kind of like understanding that I and trust their DM that he's running it right. Yeah. I think that's the biggest thing. It's a big trust factor with no initiative. I have I have loved, 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 loved no initiative combat as a role play based player because it makes combat mean something and be impactful enough that I'm not bored. Yeah. It's, which is huge. And making the combat so chaotic and things get hit so often and so hard has somewhat 
alleviated that fifth edition thing where I have to have you do two, three, four, five combats to wear out your resources and finally get the tension that we've been waiting for for however long it took to get there. Yeah. <laughs> the tension's kind of always there. Would you agree, Max? The no initiative combat system kind um, of always yeah, has tension. I definitely like that. Yeah. Oh my god, my video is cutting in and out. I don't even know if you guys can hear me Turn right off now. your camera, dude! Yeah, I can, I can uh, Okay. Uh, um, I definitely um, love Dylan's rules with the no initiative combat. It definitely makes it not only just quick pace, but also a lot more impactful, like Steph was saying. Um, <laughs> we've talked about this countless times, but... <laughs> <laughs> Dylan's homebrew. It streamlines practically everything that, that 5e uh, that makes the game sluggish. It it it, sl ugh, it makes so much more space for in other parts of the one shot that need more time, like character development and plot and yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, guys. <laughs> And, uh, I don't know, I almost wonder if No Initiative runs better without maps or with maps. I never know if combat runs better with or without maps, to be honest. I never really do. I feel like it's just, like, so much pros and cons that it's basically the same thing, just different. <laughs> Which sounds... It's just the only difference. Yeah, it's, 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 it's samey same and different different. Like, I don't know. Like, <laughs> bleh. <laughs> you know. Um... Here we go. Help action mechanic in 5e rules allows a character to, as an action, help an ally in a certain task. The rule works fine in combat, as helping an ally and distracting enemy will increase their chance of hitting enemy, but for out of combat, the rule is not realistic. And they use the example of, like, wizards shouldn't help barbarians move heavy things, and barbarians shouldn't help wizards decode arcanic runes and stuff. No, and I think that you've kind of... I've already done that kind of... You've kind of <laughs> negated that by saying, yes, you can help this person, but you must have proficiency in what you're helping them with. Yeah. So if you're helping them with an arcana check, you must have proficiency in arcana. Yeah, and in our brief experience in doing that, um, no one really feels like it's, it's something to argue about. You know, are you proficient in what you're about to help him with? He's like, no, and I'm like, meh, and they're like, ah, you know? <laughs> and that's kind of where the buck stops, which is nice. If you can find something where no one wants to argue, <laughs> it's probably fair. <laughs> it's like your go-to. Map, no map is really the player's preference. Yeah, I guess so. I prefer maps. I prefer because my characters tend to have a lot of AoE abilities. Right. And I like being able to line it up to where I'm not hitting party members and I'm hitting enough of the enemies at the same time. Yeah. But I tend to play a lot of casters, so I'm not just barging into melee. What do you think would happen if you made all AoE abilities and spells never hit allies for enemies and players. Would that simplify the, the shit well, out of it? The following the fairy steps one shot would have gone a lot smoother in that case. <laughs> yeah, that was crazy. What, they hugged each other, thunder waved, and like whatever Rasha did. I, or Rasha was a thunder wave. Uh, yeah, it was crazy. That was weird. They hugged each other and did an AoE blast where they were both hitting each other, but they're it, that was insane. I don't know what happened there. But, um... Yeah, I wonder. <laughs> what if, what... I thought if he was close enough to me, then he wouldn't then he wouldn't take damage, but he would just, like... Fair enough, I mean... <laughs> yeah, I don't even... Yeah, Earth Tremor and Thunder Waves. <laughs> yeah, Earth Milk and Cookies. <laughs> <laughs> I... I don't know. That might be fun to playtest. Yeah, to All check it out. All AoE abilities don't hit allies for enemies and players. Then there's no longer any aiming. There's no longer any asking, can I put it in a place where it's like, meh, 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 you know? Instead, you're just like, no, I don't care. Are these enemies close enough to all be in my blast? Yes or no? Boom. Same thing. Enemies are just like, boom. They don't care anymore, you know? I think taking away the oh, chance of hitting allies takes away, um, like... It just doesn't make sense in my mind. If you're putting down a wall of fire and it's not going to hit your allies, what the fuck is that fire? 
You know, it just doesn't make sense. Like, Moonbeam is a literal beam of radiant damage, and if your ally happens to be in it, I can't just, like, morph a donut hole in the middle around <laughs> my ally. You know what I mean? So, well, I mean, thematically, it's not avoiding your players. It's just simply not hurting them magically, is my mm -hmm. idea. So you don't have to, like... There are I'm spells that don't AL. hit allies already. There's features that allow that. So, I don't know. For me... You know, for me, especially with Vari, you saw a lot of times where you're like, I'm like, I'm going to hit you. Do you care? And Brillo would always be like, nah, throw it. It's fine. And like, yeah. I throw the spell anyway and she'd pass or fail, whatever. But like, you know, I think it adds a lot of fun if you're in the right environment with, with your players where you're like, I'm, I don't mean to hurt you, but I got to do this, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think it affects it so much that it does anything good or bad, I guess. Just less questions. I'm just imagining a cool situation where someone has a dragon breath and then the other player splits it with their blade so that it flows around them. <laughs> uh. That'd be kind of dope. Yeah. Just like holding the blade up. You would have to have like a fire resistant blade or something. <laughs> That'd be pretty cool. <laughs> uh, potting. The Red Sea, more like parting the dragon's breath. That would be cool. That could be, that could be sick. But situation on nonetheless, I will shut the hell up. Oh my gosh, you're Max, good. You're good. you have great ideas. Stop downing on yourself. My audio cuts out so much. I've questioned that you guys hear like half. I heard you, and we love you. And drink your water. You're fine now that you've turned on your uh, video. Turned your video off. Yeah, it sounds better. Yeah, I guess. Ignoring drawing and switching weapons. That sounds like an easy rule to implement that probably would be better. It might be a little bit of quality of life. I mean, in reality, outside of, like, how often do you switch weapons? Like... In reality. For melee classes, it's pretty clutch. You know, because every class has a backup weapon, whether it's a javelin, a light crossbow, so on and so forth. And if an enemy is running, because running is such a bitch... Everyone moves like the same speeds, especially if they're using dash action. Um, it's nice if you can just go swap, shoot, you know, or just like chuck javelin or situations like that where the enemy is just trying to get away from you. Or worse, they, I don't know, misty step uh, up to like a, the second story, but you don't have teleportation or flight or anything like that. So instead, it'd be nice if you could just swap and shoot that turn without having to drop a weapon or any of that extra flip fluff that doesn't really seem necessary you should be able to just put your weapon away and draw it i don't think that's too crazy yeah you know i mean even i know it sounds terrible i'm comparing it to a video game but like even in video games like you're always able to just kind of swap weapons period you know um but in video games for example if you happen to have a shield and you're swapping you can't swap back so that turn, if you elected to switch to your crossbow to shoot someone, you can't switch back to your sword and shield before your turn ends. Yeah. Just to get your armor class to stay up. In order to still do a ranged attack and so on and so forth. That's probably the only thing I would add in there, just for shield using characters. Yeah. You know, or I guess any character for that matter, because maybe there's some defensive bonuses I don't know about. So long as you're wielding a certain weapon that you're really good with, you can do cool things. So I guess swapping shouldn't take an action but you can't swap back once you've done it yeah i mean that's pretty that's turn. pretty commonplace like in Salasta and even in baldur's gate like you can't if you are designating to use your ranged weapon and you switch from your melee you then can't go back yeah that's how i would rule that one you know just throw away all the action stuff that happens with it but yeah you can't switch back once you switch until the next turn uh hit dice while leveling up i keep seeing this one they get to roll hit dice to see how much their hit points increase, or instead they can choose the average. Um, since D&D is a game based on dice, most players like to roll, but that means sometimes they're disappointed with a low roll and they end up having weaker characters for the rest of the party. Some DMs give the players a choice to roll one time, and if they roll below average, they can choose the average number instead. This means players always gain at least the average number of hit points and avoid the devastating feeling of rolling a one. Eh, I don't know. Isn't that the whole point? Isn't that the whole point of giving the choice to roll or take the average? 
you have a, it's a gamble, and you, you, you consciously I think it lets them roll, but also gives them a certain amount of security. Knowing yeah, that their the level the day, up meant some. If you want to do it based on rolling, you need to be okay with it. That's the thing. Yeah, it's... Players want to be as strong as possible. The they time. don't really care about rolling the dice. They just think it's fun when they get a big number. It's, again, the god-moding mindset of, like, oh my god, now I'm going to be weaker in combat, but it just means you have to be smarter in combat. Yeah, like I got. And again, I realize I'm very opinionated on this. Everybody can do things how they want to. This is just how I like it. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I'm just trying to wrap it around my head where it's just like you consciously choose to roll. You don't have to. That's why you can choose. And if you do choose, you know it's a gamble going into it. You could potentially come out stronger than everyone who chose the average. That's the benefit of choosing to do that. But there's also a risk involved. And I feel like that just makes so much sense. Yeah, you shouldn't take away a risk. Yeah, like why, right? Like, because the rest of role-playing needs to be like that. Everything you do should be a mm. calculated holding, risk. Holding a play the dice roll devalues the roll. Yeah, even Tommy Fly likes the consequences, you know, because there's a choice. I think it's the whole point of having a choice to roll or not. But, like, what's the point? If they're gonna get the average no matter what anyways and they can roll higher you might as well like, i don't know like it's just like i don't know i don't see the point in giving them that extra advantage just so they don't feel bad like <laughs> like i don't want to i don't want to sound mean but like you I, might as well just tell them that I'm... yeah yeah i don't like the idea of giving Take them away the dash roll entirely yeah, I mean, that's the thing, too, right? It's like rolling for attributes. Like, I've always, always rolled. I've never done point by. I hate point by. Uh, I think it's just really annoying because why wouldn't you just, like, you know, never give yourself a negative modifier, never give yourself any sort of, yeah, you know, disability. And when I tell you, except for my Sunday campaign for some reason, that every single character I've rolled without... A single one missed. I've always rolled an eight or nine. Somewhere in there. Somewhere in there. And I don't re-roll that number because that's just what it rolled. It, it's the dice have given me. So I place it where I need to be and I use that in my character. Like, it's it gives it character and personality. And, like, that's what this is all about, right? Like Yeah. But, like... It takes, it takes skill to be able to use an eight or a nine and make it... I agree. You can make it yours, because yeah. uh, a great character, like you said, revolves around its strengths and its weaknesses. And sometimes that can be incredibly, incredibly hard to portray in, in roleplay. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in something like a one shot, where your character exists for a fraction of a time. Exactly. And then never again. <laughs> Flaws produce deeper narrative. Flaws make better characters. I will say I agree with that. But at the same time, if I'm playing characters that have anything more than one dump stat, it, it hurts my roleplay brain because I want to roleplay. If they have negative modifiers, that means they have below average wisdom, below average intelligence. There's something actually wrong with them. That's what these numbers represent. Anything that's like a, a 10 or an 11, I think, is always a zero. So if you got a 10 or 11, that means you're perfectly average and on par with the rest of the commonplace people. But anything below that means you're less than average. So in my mind, if I have more than one stat that's below that and started giving negative modifiers, it feels like, what is, what's, what's six? Two out of six of your stats are gone. Like a quarter of your character is jacked up and like each individual stat is a pretty big part of your character. Yeah. If they've got... <laughs> crap like charisma and intelligence they're dumb and they don't know how to talk to people it's tough i guess i don't know like i don't know how to feel about it really it's a double-edged sword it's a double-edged sword and you, you have to find a way to really get around it like i think i think being able to re-roll if you have two really bad rolls that's fine but re-rolling if you have one is just ridiculous yeah. because then you're just upset that you have a character flaw and you can't work with it. I like having one dump stat, but having like two or three dump stats 
that's when it starts to feel really bad, I feel. Yeah. You know, especially since so many skills are based on these things, too. You know, depending on which one you, you do. Like, wisdom, charisma, and intelligence have so many skills based on them. Like, strength and dexterity are only, like, two per. But, like, the rest are, like, a ton, right? You want to be good in combat, but your dumb stats are wisdom and intelligence, and all of your skills are out the window. <laughs> and it's, like, it feels like you just don't matter anymore. So I feel like having... Two bad stats warrants maybe a reroll on one of them. Maybe I don't know. Um, yeah. Hemp is the player experience. Yeah, Tommy Fly says he likes to do point five, but adding in the ability to subtract points from a starting attribute to add more somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah, like when you start going into the negatives, you get extra points to put them in other places. Um. That's always nice, you know point by isn't a bad system i think everyone just has fun rolling random stats yeah i like but the problem is is most of the time they only have fun when it's broken stats (laughs) it's just like the health thing right it's only fun unless you get an 18 it's all fun and games so you get the one right yeah so (laughs) yeah fumbling action oriented monsters a very common issue with D&D 5th edition, especially in higher levels, is the action economy often is more important than having a single strong enemy. This fight makes this makes fights with iconic monsters, such as dragons and beholders, somewhat easy for high level parties. Matt Colville introduced um, the idea of action-oriented monsters, and this approach to designing and tweaking monsters has gained a lot of popularity. With this approach, the enemies will have access to bonus actions and reactions like players and they can have special actions called villain actions, which helps create a more challenging and interesting combat in higher levels of D&D. I dig that. Or not even just higher levels. If you happen to be fighting one big bad who's supposed to be cool and you want him to have impact, yeah, have him do stuff in between characters, play, players' actions, or like in reaction to players' actions. Um, almost feels like a necessity if you're trying to beef up the one guy against five. But of course, role play you have to make it make sense, right? He needs to be a larger than life character and not just your average dude. Yeah. Point by is good for the simple fact that it tries to standardize attributes, but a good part of being is having parties with people that are wildly different. Yeah. Absolutely. How do you want to do this? That is a great homebrew rule. That's like giving people their last words when they die. Yeah. Um, instead of like like when something big's about to happen you ask them yeah how do you want to do this that's always a good one they know they just killed them and it's like it's a nice thematic way of having that happen um I f- just off topic uh I feel the way that 5B is built it doesn't um market for any teamwork within combat it's very much Oh, I'm gonna do this singular thing that benefits only me and hurts the enemy. The only person who actively does teamwork-based things are bards and healers and support classes. True. If there were more options, a fight or well, I think there are more options than players realize. They're just not outlined in the book. And I think that's what's important is that players need to start giving themselves the responsibility to think for themselves. A huge uh, example of this was when we were fighting the Demon of Greed. And he was getting ready to do his massive explosion attack. One of our allies was not going to be able to get out of the way. And my character in wild shape form threw herself on top of him to save him from the blast and take the damage. Yeah, I had um, her take, like, double damage, I think. Yeah. Instead of just utterly negating the damage. Because I felt like at that point, tanky characters could constantly hug squishy characters and avoid the damage entirely. So I made him take double damage in order to even, like, kind of approve it. Yeah, and I mean, I, I went down. Yeah, you like, got knocked out of I, shape for sure. I got knocked out, I went down, but I saved my, char- my, my friend's character all because I asked. Like... Yeah. It wasn't something that was in the rules. There's no rule for it. But I was like, 
I could do this. I'm close enough to hop on top of him and take this damage. And I'm not as bad off as he is. Can I do this? So thinking of ways to get out of the selfish mindset of what can I do in battle and more in the mindset of what can my party do in battle together, I think is more on the players and less on the rules of the DM. Yeah. But if you disagree, please tell, please let me know. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to have players that ask for out-of-pocket things and the DM finds cool ways to make it work. I think that's a nice place to be for sure. Without a doubt, you know. Um, but, like... Within reason. Within reason. And also, like... I don't know. Like, I had a player once who... Um, I'm not even sure if it's a good example. But essentially, he wanted... Kent wanted to throw a ma- throw his mace in order to stun the creature. Like, it's like, like a hammer. It's, it's like a large creature, so he wanted to, like, shock put his own weapon to, like, kind of do a stun on it which isn't something he's actually able to do. He doesn't have any features for it, and so on and so forth. Um, but it does make sense. If he can do it successfully. Right. So we, we did a, a roll and see if it worked out, yeah. You know, which is great for him. I think him. he actually gave a destiny point to do that. I think he did. He gave a destiny point to be able to roll for that. Yeah, yeah. that's what we did. That's when we started getting really cool ideas. Like, anything that sounded completely out of your character's purview of, of ability to do, um, you could use my destiny points to just kind of alter the game. You know? It sort of gave destiny points that extra flair where it's like, you can break the world a little bit. Which a lot, which isn't something new. It's something a lot of people do with like luck dice, inspirations, destiny points, stuff like that, where it's kind of like you can do things you're not normally capable of, kind of alter things, um, if it seems cool. You know? But yeah. Anywho. Yeah. I think we've talked this topic into the ground. Into the ground, absolutely. You know, with, with homebrew rules and stuff. There's really only so much you can do. But, um... It would... It would be nice to have magic items come back somehow. Come back to relevance. You know? I think maybe that's why there's so many homebrew items out there. And I think that's why everyone kind of, like, gets on yeah. with... They get on with that idea. They're all on board with it, making up homebrew stuff. So that way items are more interesting than just being plus ones, plus twos, or plus one to AC, or so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know how to feel about it. Because then it's incumbent upon the DM to constantly come up with the most interesting items just to get people interested. Whereas back in the day, it used to be you were in such a box and had so many restrictions that you were fiending for the for the for the smallest things. Yeah. Um. So I don't know. Like too many options. Like yeah, <laughs> like most things with modern role play, it's always incumbent upon the DM more and more and more and more to make it engaging because players already have so much that it's hard to big things have big impacts you know yeah 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 which also kind of makes me think of like when people are like well i'm a college of this that person or i'm a wizard of this that thing is this something i'd know because of that that's a hard one to rule i think that's the whole purpose of the check right like and like the whole point of rolling the arcana thing is that not necessarily your character's history pertains to what he's looking up it's more or less you're doing a role with your character's proficiency or expertise in this area to determine whether or not he can remember that anyways so i think in all circumstances you have to look at it in a way where it's like yes your character did hear about this at one point in time but chances of him remembering it specifically in this moment however long it's been since he learned it in the first place that's what the role is for to sort of recall knowledge is my idea of it you know um yeah how much you remember not do you remember yeah i think the only time your character's history can trump that is if you've earned something in game so if you're in a campaign and you join a thieves guild 
let's say you have contacts or people that you commune with in this guild, I think that's the only time you'd be like, well, hey, because of XYZ, Thieves Guild, this, that, and the third, would I already know this? I think that's when it comes up. But as far as like your class and whatever subclass it is and stuff like that, I think that's when a role always has to happen. Yeah, absolutely. You know, because I'll just explain it as a, from a DM perspective, I'll just explain it as like, yeah, your character has experience in this stuff, but like whether or not they can draw upon that knowledge right now, you're rolling for it because not everyone has a mind palace <laughs> Mind palace. Of everything they've remembered ever since they started adventuring. Yeah. You know? So. Yeah. Cool. Well, I hope everybody has a wonderful July 4th. Yeah. If you celebrate it. Yep. Happy 4th of July to anyone who is in a place in the world that you do celebrate that. <laughs> um, and yeah, thanks for coming by and talk with us. I yeah, think- thank you so much. I think it was a lot of fun and uh, definitely a lot more laid back than most of the tavern talks. Yeah. You know, so we'll catch you guys next week again. We do these tavern talks every Sunday at uh, 1 p.m. We get our little, our little team together. We get some guest speakers. Usually we'll have like a topic of discussion um, or, a, or a few topics. And today we just kind of just winged it because it's a holiday. We're just like, let's talk about homebrew rules and just wing it. You know, so this was fun. Yeah, I like this. This is nice. Max usually doesn't DC every four seconds either. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> hit or miss with his internet. But thank you guys for coming. Um, we appreciate all of you. Um, we can see if there's anyone worth rating. Joe Fudge? Ah, he has like a million quadrillion viewers. <laughs> you know. All right, we'll just uh, we'll pip off. All right, have a happy holiday, everyone. Bye, guys. Bye. See ya.